All right, hello, welcome back to Unqualified Analysis. This is take two. Um, only fault is my own because I started recording with the wrong audio device. At least I caught it early on this time instead of noticing it in post that my voice sounds like absolute shit. Uh, I am in quite a mood today. Not a great mood at all. Um, it's it's just one of those days where you get off of work, uh, you're rolling into an off day, and just for whatever reason, it just feels like someone took a big, fat, stinky shit in my Cheerios right now. Don't know why. We're just going to keep it rolling, though, straight into my analysis. So it should be a spicy episode of Unqualified Analysis here. We are talking about the AFC West at some point here later on in the show uh, after I get through the headlines because there's a lot to get to from when I was on vacation, yada, yada, yada. We're back now, though, uh, talking about the AFC West. You're continuing the division preview series at some point, but I got a hell of a lot of headlines to get to, and I have just about no patience left. So, with that said, let's get into the headline shell. Kicking us off, I can't remember if I got to this uh, on the last episode or not, so we're just throwing it in here. Uh, Quinn Williams signed a big-time four-year extension, I want to say it was $96 million, uh, to stick around and avert a crisis with the New York Jets. Good for them. Uh, kudos to them. Uh, I think highest paid uh, defensive tackle in the league outside of Aaron Donald. So just about where he should be as far as I'm concerned. We'll get back to the Jets here in just a second. But I got a million headlines and a division to preview. So we're just going to keep it moving from there. Quinn Williams got himself paid. Also got himself paid Alex Highsmith of the Pittsburgh Steelers. Outside linebacker just coming off of fresh off of a 14 and a half sack year and gets rewarded for it. Four years, 68 million. Basically only the final year of his rookie deal and 2024 are guaranteed. We are right up to our old tricks of funny money. Less than half of that $68 million is guaranteed. So Steelers definitely won't screw him. The NFL teams don't do that to players at all. That's, that's you know, $68 million, He's getting every cent of that. That's exactly what's going to happen. Good for him for getting paid, though, I suppose. Uh, up next, Jordan Addison. This was a fun one to look at on my timeline. Uh, got a citation for driving 140 miles per hour. Reckless, as you may know. But he did say he had an emergency with his dog. Was never specified what that emergency was. But with that in mind, don't drive 140 miles an hour, kids. But I get it. I I understand. I can't say uh, for sure I wouldn't do the same if my sweet, sweet Riley uh, was not in a, in a similar situation. I think I said that right. Probably didn't. Who cares? Life is a fuck. Uh, existence is suffering. We're just going to keep it moving from there. But Jordan Addison, driving, driving 140 miles an hour, bad. Driving 140 miles an hour towards your dog because they're having an emergency, also bad. Might be a straight up lie, but understandable if it's not so we'll just keep moving from there won't be a suspension does not matter in the grand scheme of things but a fun story i suppose nonetheless because no one got hurt um outside of that uh the league officially finalized the sale of the commies to josh harris slapped dan snyder with a 60 million dollar fine on the way out the door sounds like a lot i mean 60 million dollars is a lot but you got to kind of contextualize this $60 million is less than one, a little under actually, 1% of what Daniel Snyder just sold the team for and just officialized it. So, I mean, oh, oh man, that stinks. You find me $60 million after I, oh, interestingly enough, just found $6.05 billion in my bank account. That's, well, what fortuitous timing of that, that fine coming in right there, but he's gone I don't think anyone in Washington necessarily cares as long as he is no longer the owner of that franchise. Congratulations to the Washington Commie fans. Your long-running nightmare is officially, 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 officially over. Danny Snyder's gone. He's never coming back. You got Josh Harris and Mag Magic Johnson uh, doing it now, who 
the ceiling is the roof, I suppose, but the floor is very, very, I, I don't even know what I'm trying to say. What I am trying to say, though, is that it cannot and will not be worse than the Dan Snyder era. So rejoice, rejoice, folks. You have finally got a team back that you can feel good about cheering for. And you know, that's that's really what we all want. Not everybody uh, can be the Vikings where you got a, a first-class organization, never win championships, but you know, still winning games in most years, being a, a class organization. You know what? You you guys might have that now in Washington. That's just that's just lovely to see. You love to see it. Uh, up next, uh, Titans restructure Kevin Byers contract uh, base is down from fourteen million to eleven million. M makes sense, I guess. If you're the Titans. I don't know about Kevin Byard. I, I guess he likes the Titans a lot, so he, he decided to make some money go and in incentives. Dude made the Pro Bowl last year. He's one of the best safeties in the league, so didn't necessarily earn a pay cut, but what are you going to do? That's that's safeties in the modern NFL for you right there. Running backs to the defense right now. Uh, Melvin Gordon signed a one-year deal with the Ravens. He'll be in the rotation I would assume the running game of the Ravens is going to be similar to what it has been in the past under Greg Roman, just with the with the distinct Todd Munkin style uh, superposed into that. But there's going to be three or four running backs rotating throughout there, and you got Lamar Jackson making everyone's making everyone's job that much easier. Only a good thing to add a, a talented guy like Melvin Gordon into that that mix as well. So good for him for landing with the Ravens. He'll probably have a, a solid year there. Uh, maybe not the highest numbers in the world, but his efficiency will be better than probably just about any other time in his entire career. So kudos to him for getting that one uh, done. Uh, NFL's hottest COVID rapper, Cole Beasley, is signing a one-year deal with the Giants. Reunites with old, old boy Brian Dayball, who was his offensive coordinator with the Buffalo Bills back in the day. So we got we got uh, Coley Rhymes himself coming back into the NFL, uh, adding to the, the list of about seven number three receivers that the New York Giants have. They are loading up on guys that are rotational in just about every other receiving core. They got a bunch of them. So, I mean, they got a very deep receiving core. No real number one guy. Probably, you know, maybe Jalen Hyatt gets into there. You've been hearing some crazy stuff about, about his straight line speed. Running 24 miles an hour clock, that I think fastest in the NFL this year, fastest in the NFL in quite some time. Uh, but outside of that, not really a whole lot to be overly excited about. Not really a whole lot to be under optimistic about either. I mean, they've got a you know just a middling receiver group, very good offensive coordinator, and Saquon Barkley back. So things are looking good for the Giants. Maybe another playoff year this year. I don't care. Uh, let's keep it moving. Chiefs defensive tackle Chris Jones holding out for a new deal, and that has remained unchanged uh, unless something dramatic has happened that I just did not hear about for whatever reason. Uh, and if you didn't know, in the current CBA, you are fined, uh, not a hundred, fifty thousand dollars a day that you miss of training camp. So that that bill is racking up. Quick, he is in the hundreds of thousands at this point uh, with the number of days he's missed. Uh, a man of principle, though, a man who's made a lot of money thus far, and a man from my alma mater, Mississippi State. So go get your money, King. This defense literally cannot function without you. So just go ahead, Chiefs. You can, you can skimp on the receiving core. You can skimp on running backs just like everyone else does. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, you can skimp all over the field. You can't be skimping on the QB. You can't be skimping on that defensive tackle, Chris Jones. One of the best defensive tackles in the entire game. Pay that man his money, I say, and that's all, that's all I have to say about that. Uh, Bills will lose the returner uh, slash running back Naeem Hines for the entire year after a, kind of a freak jet ski accident. Uh, I guess he was sitting there stationary. Uh, some big dumb dipshit decided he's going to ram his jet ski directly into the side of Naeem Hines' jet ski, like, I don't know, crush the shit out of his leg. I don't know what the actual injury is. All I know is he's done for the season. Might be done in the NFL in general. Hope not. Very good player, explosive player when he's out there. But he's a running back, and he is uh, past the age of prime, if you will, coming off a very major uh, non-football injury. I mean, contact with a jet ski sort of injury. So probably not going to see a whole lot of Naheem Hines 
going forward in the NFL, and you simply hate to see it, but once again, running back in the modern NFL, the shittiest of shitty positions to play uh, on the entire field if you're looking for money right now, and or longevity, because neither of which are coming your way if you are running back in the modern NFL. Uh, let's just uh, let's, let's take a break from the running back talk here for just a second. Talk about Seahawks linebacker uh, slash pass rusher Uchenna Nuosu. Fun name there. Great name to say. And he's going to have a lot more fun because he just signed a three-year $45 million extension. Could be worth up to 59 and uh, didn't quite have some explosive sack numbers last year. You look at some of the advanced, like, you know, pressure statistics, all that stuff, uh, as far as, you know, win rate on the defensive line. He was one of the better pass rushers in the entire league last year. Kind of a similar play style to Jadavion Clowney at the height of his powers. Um, did well in the run game as well. Well worth the money they paid him. I hope he gets every single cent of that $59 million, though he won't. That's just simply not how this thing works. But $45 million over three years. This is why players are signing those two-year deals in free agency. So if they have a big-time first year, they can cash in right away on another deal to stay with the team and make even more money off it makes a whole lot of sense you risk it risk a little bit you bet on yourself but if that bet pays off it pays off big time and it paid off big time for Chenna Nwosu to the tune of 45 million dollars in addition to I believe the 22 that he got last season so Nwosu's doing well for himself over there in Seattle Let's talk about the running backs again, though, shall we? Saquon Barkley, he signed a one-year incentive-laden deal in lieu of the tag. I think he gets a little bit more. Uh, he, the, the tag was like a little over $10 million. You'll get $11 million base on this uh, on this deal. I think another $2 million in incentives that could possibly get him up to 13 which I, I would say he, Saquon Barkley is basically the entire offense. Uh, he is the straw that stirs the drink over there, so I would I would peg it very likely, as long as he stays healthy, that he gets that big time, uh, That I guess not big time, but those incentives to get it up to 13 uh, this year. Outside of that, can still be tagged next year, though, so that's kind of a, an L, kind of just running back as usual here that that's just how this thing works in the modern NFL um also Jonathan Taylor requested a trade after his owner went out there and said some shit I mean Jim Hersey did not hold back uh, well this t this requires some context that if you missed it over my my little uh break in the woods here the running backs got together in a Zoom call hosted by Austin Eckler and uh, basically just said, hey, guys, this shit is fucked. We're not getting any money. Uh, the second our rookie contracts are up, we're basically just being kicked to the curb because the, the running back's probably the highest hit rate of any position being drafted in the entire NFL right now. So you draft a guy in like the third, fourth, fifth, hell, even a seventh round pick, Isaiah Pacheco, absolutely fucked right in the ass but when he gets done with his rookie deal because he's on a four-year deal making probably less than a million dollars on most of those years and by the time with especially with his playing style he gets done with that rookie deal they're just going to do the exact same thing they just did the Clyde Edwards Hilaire uh, before him just draft a guy hey get out of here you old 25 year old man we don't want you anymore go try free agency where you won't get hardly any money either that's just a modern running back uh, plight. Talked about it before. Talked about it in free agency. Talked about it over and over again. It's not changing. It sucks. I hate it a lot. I wish we would find a way to change it. Probably the only way to change it is to uh, go back and just get rid of the franchise tag. But that brings me to what Jim Ursay uh, was saying on Twitter, just straight up on Twitter. He didn't he didn't put it out through back channels or anything like that. He just straight up tweeted out basically like, hey, these running backs uh, trying to, to retroactively go back in the CBA and renegotiate, just simply not appropriate right now. Uh, essentially saying like, hey, suck it up. This is the CBA everyone signed, and we're just going to keep it moving from here. It sucks for you. It's great for me. Sucks for you. Nana nana boo boo. Suck my big fat cock. That's basically what he said throughout that in that entire uh, exchange there. Not in so many words, obviously, but that's that's basically the, the the gist of it. Is like, hey, 
snooze you lose it sucks sucks for you great for me but you're gonna have to suck it up because we all signed a, a collective bargaining agreement here which he's not wrong just probably should leave the quiet part quiet instead of saying the quiet part out loud. Um, that did not exactly endear him with his running back. Uh, Jonathan Taylor requested a trade from the Indianapolis Colts. So that's still an ongoing situation and a situation that I don't really see getting any less messy anytime soon. So that should be fun. He's looking for a new deal. Won't get it. It's going to get uncomfortable. Can't wait for that to keep percolating. And also, Josh Jacobs still hasn't shown up. Can't be fined either because he doesn't technically, he's not technically under contract. He hasn't signed the franchise tender. He could pull a Le'Veon Bell and just stay home all season if he wants to. So, if I were him, maybe I would do that. I mean, he was the entire offense for the Las Vegas Raiders last year. I mean, Derek Carr was like, okay. Okay, Devontae Adams, don't want to disrespect Devontae Adams. He was fantastic last year. But you got Jimmy G at quarterback now. You do have a, a pretty solid group of weapons over there. But running back, I think they drafted Zamir White out of, uh, out of Georgia last year. And then after Zamir White, I don't know what else they have back there. Uh, Josh Jacobs, with the amount of miles he's been uh, have, has been put on his body since he got into the NFL, shit, I wouldn't show up either. I mean, it's it's another uh, another case of uh, the running backs being underpaid um, and not really that changing. And I mean, it's the only position where the franchise tag number has gone down over the last five, ten years, as opposed to going up. Every other position has gone up with you know just the general trend of inflation and revenue building in the NFL. Running backs, they're just like, let me wipe my ass with that shit contract you've got there, and then laugh in your face, maybe spit in it too while we're at it. Doesn't matter, we're just gonna draft the guy in the mid to late rounds, pay him next to nothing, run him into dust, grind him to absolutely nothing, and then we're going to do it over and over and over again until we get a new CBA or something changes. So running backs are in a bad spot, that is all to say. And it's really coming to a head now. It's getting uncomfortable uh, for some players, some teams right now. And you hate to see it. I personally d despise this. I, I wish... I've said it maybe got to get my thoughts together here, but I've said it before, there's no denying the economics of the position. If you have a, a upper mid-level running back, it is more cost-effective to simply go into the draft and draft the guy. I mean, there's no other way around it. Even if it's a slight drop-off, you get a slight drop-off for a fraction of what they would be making if you're signing a big, big second contract with that running back. With guys like Saquon Barkley, with guys like Josh Jacobs, hell, even Jonathan Taylor, he was banged up last year, played in a terrible situation, all of that, but still, all three of those guys kind of fit what I'm going for here. There is a certain level of running back where they do enough for your team and they change the math for a defense in such a way that I think you should pay those guys. They deserve to be paid because they make your offense that much better merely by having their presence on the field. And I, I hate that these teams have just decided, you know what, fuck that. We are not at all going to, going to pay guys that deserve to be paid. We're just going to keep going back to this cheap labor over and over and over again and you're going to go to free agency, probably sit there for a while, like all of these running backs that have just been sitting there waiting for training camp to come around, like Melvin Gordon just sitting around uh, for the longest time, though he's kind of on the on the back side of his career. Um, Kareem Hunt, he's had his, his stuff going on. Dalvin Cook still hasn't signed anywhere. He's got some uh, interest with the Jets, which, again, we'll talk about in just a second, but it's a terrible time to be a running back. Uh, if you've got a kid out there, if they're trying to decide what position to play, for the love of God, get them to play wide receiver, and if they can't catch, get them to play corner. Don't, do not get your kid to play running back unless you want them to have their knees destroyed, their feet and ankles destroyed, shoulders, their entire body. They'll be walking with a walker at age 55 uh, with just about no money in their bank account because they'll be put through a meat grinder for basically nothing uh, at the NFL level. So if you got a kid trying to decide what position to play, don't let them play running back. And that's where I'm going to end off uh, that little tirade there.
Uh, Saints picked up Jimmy Graham again. First time being back in the league. Uh, took last year off. Um, was going to sail around the world, it seemed like. Uh, now he is back with the Saints. Probably will catch some jump balls. Make some people feel all warm and fuzzy down there uh, in New Orleans. Outside of that, eh, it's a backup tight end. I, I don't really... We don't really care too much. Um, one thing I do care about, people getting money. And Trevon Diggs got himself a bag, kind of. Uh, five years, $97 million on an extension with the Dallas Cowboys, becoming one of the higher paid corners in the league. Like Alex Highsmith's deal, though, only 2023 and 2024 guaranteed the last last uh, year of his rookie deal and the first year of the extension. Those are the only ones that are guaranteed. There's a team option after that, which they'll probably pick up because you don't let a guy like Trevon Diggs go uh, just like that. But if there's a major in injury, he's screwed. That's just kind of how this uh, this whole thing is structured. Uh, he's going to have to eat that. Not going to be fun for him, but Ninety-seven million dollars. That's a big fun number, isn't it? Uh, that's you know that's a that's a good deal uh, to sign, I suppose. Either way, good for him getting money. It, at, at the very least, he's going to have one year on that deal where he's making bank absolute money bags. Um, after that, we'll just have to see what happens. Hopefully, he does not get injured. I'm praying for good health for the man Trevon Diggs. Um, Justin Herbert reset the QB market. Talk about a guy who did get a whole lot of guaranteed money. It's a guy that you have to pay because he's the most important position on the field. Justin Herbert signs a five-year, $262 million extension, 218.7 of that guaranteed. Over $200 million, close to $220 million is going to be in his bank account by the time this deal is done. That is big time money for Justin Herbert. We knew it was going to be something like that. All eyes now are on Cincinnati with Joe Burrow. Talk about him in just a second because he made some news for not the greatest reasons. Not off field. Let's not let's not get ahead of ourselves here. But uh, good deal to have for for uh, Justin Herbert. It just means that Joe Burrow's deal just keeps on getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you know what? His owner is just a startling level of cheap ass. So I am still wondering how that is going to work out over there in Cincy. But for now, let's just celebrate the fact that Justin Herbert got paid, got life-changing money, and uh, will probably re-up again here in, in five years or so just because of the way the quarterback position is played. Good for that guy. Just good for that guy. Uh, another extension, Giants locked up Andrew Thomas, left tackle, Pro Bowl left tackle. In fact, five years, $117 million, 67 of that is guaranteed. So basically, first two years, three years of the deal, something like that, is fully guaranteed, it seems like. And then we'll go after that. There's a team option or whatnot. Andrew Thomas uh, probably will be around, but again, Who's to say with injuries and whatnot, he could get absolutely shafted when it's all said and done, but good for him. I believe this was the richest uh, offensive lineman contract of all time. I mean, $117.5 million, nothing to sneeze at there, and that's $67 million guaranteed. Even if he gets absolutely shafted, that is life-changing money that he can just kind of pass on to his kids at some point down the road. So good for Andrew Thomas getting that. Uh, Joe Burrow talked about him briefly before making news. The news was went down with a calf strain, pretty serious calf strain, early in training camp. It was a scary situation. It was caught on video. Looked like he might have popped his Achilles just being that it was a non-contact sort of thing. Luckily, that didn't happen. Got a calf strain. Probably means we're not going to see him at all in the preseason, but it does mean... Uh, there's a good chance we're going to see him out there week one. And if not week one, we'll see him in week two. This is not a not a super big deal. Just means no preseason for Joe Burrow this year, which who cares? Who cares about the preseason when you're a veteran quarterback? Just get to the regular season so we can play the games that really matter when it's all said and done. Get well, Joe Burrow. You're one of the more fun players to watch in the league, so I have Nothing but good wishes for you. Uh, Aaron Rodgers, let's talk about the Jets here for just a second. He took, he went from uh, $110 million over the next two years to 
uh, 75 million, if you're doing the quick math at home, that is $35 million of pay cut that he took, gives the Jets some cap flexibility, and the Packers fans got salty. My goodness, did they get salty. And I can understand why, because uh, you just probably ask yourself, why didn't you do that for, why didn't you do that for my team? Which, <laughs> As a Vikings fan, it is hilarious. I, I cannot deny to you, it is hilarious. And my dog shit mood right now is just, oh, it's letting me revel in this schadenfreude. I mean, it's it sucks, don't it? It really, really does suck having that guy extract every possible cent he could from your front office, from your team, fully expecting to go into those seasons and take all of that money. He goes to the Jets realizes he can actually go win a championship next year and says, hey, why don't you just go out there, sign a couple more players? Here's $35 million. I'm so happy to no longer be in Green Bay that I'm just going to give it. You have this money. I don't even care anymore. I'm getting taxed higher in New York. Um, but you know what? I'm having a great time over here, and I think we can win a championship. So go ahead. Take my money. I don't even want it anymore. Just go go take my money. Uh, that's That's pretty much what happened there. And Dalvin Cook is now flirting with the front office there. Seems like he could sign there within the next week or so. I don't don't know that for sure. Don't have any information to suggest such a thing. But he visited practice the other day. Uh, seems like he's really vibing with uh, the atmosphere over there with the Jets. Be, that feels like a place where he's going to ultimately end up landing. It's probably just going to take some some wrangling with the agents and such. Still want him back with the with the Vikings, quite frankly. I would love to have Dalvin Cook back with the Vikings, if at all possible. Just looking less and less possible by the day. Uh, let's talk even more about Aaron Rodgers. Uh, Sean Payton verbally set fire to the Broncos coaching staff in 2022. Uh, basically just said, one of the worst coaching jobs I've ever seen. Absolutely terrible. Uh, didn't name Nathaniel Hackett by name, but basically said, hey, Nathaniel Hackett, you could just fucking sit up here and read Shakespeare all day. That would be a better coaching job than what you did last year. You stink, bud. You are terrible at your job. That's essentially what uh, Sean Payton said when it came to the coaching job uh, with the Broncos last year. Uh, said everyone's got some stink on their hands and whatnot. Uh, Aaron Rodgers fired back, said, keep my coach's names out of your mouth. And by the way, if you're wondering if, hey, do these teams play each other this year? <laughs> they do. They play each other in week five in Denver, uh, the Broncos will play the Jets. That is one to keep an eye on, folks. But that is just, just some fun drama to start the training camp off. Uh, as Sean Payton put it, uh, he had his Fox hat on, uh, being that he was an analyst last year. Make, makes sense. Uh, makes makes a lot of sense. We, we all have those moments sometimes. We're just firing from the hip. Uh, he just happened to do it in a, in, a, in a situation where you probably shouldn't have it. I think he acknowledged as much, uh, got confronted with the Aaron Rodgers comments, and basically said, we're on to, we're on to Cincinnati at this point, uh, to, to quote Bill Belichick from back in the day. Didn't even really acknowledge it, which, fair enough, but that Week 5 matchup should be fun, fun times for those who are more petty out there, which I sometimes am, so I'm going to be looking forward to that. Uh, Trey Hendrickson, Signed a one-year extension to keep him with Cincy through 2025. I think it's $21 million in new money, both through, I think he got a pay raise in this season and uh, kept that pay raise into next year as well. So extra $21 million. Congratulations to Trey Hendrickson. Good for him. Uh, Jalen Ramsey, total tone shift there, but he tore his meniscus. And uh, he got a repair job instead of a cut job, which means uh, he will be out until at least December. It's a three, four month sort of injury. So we'll be there for a playoff push when they need him. Uh, could be even longer than December, though, just based on whether it heals up properly. Uh, big loss for the for the Dolphins, though. Really looking forward to seeing Jalen Ramsey opposite of Xavier and Howard. Maybe the best corner duo in the entire league. Now we got to wait a little bit uh, until Jalen Ramsey gets healthy, gets back in the lineup. Uh, Dolphins signed cornerback Eli Apple to bolster their depth in response to the injury. I, do, I still do think you got Javon Holland on the back end. You still got Xavier and Howard on one side. 
Uh, got Kedrico, who played well last year. They got a couple guys uh, that played well in that secondary. I think the secondary is still going to do fine. He got a big Fangio call on the plays over there. So I'm not sure it's going to have uh, the biggest impact in the world. I still think they're going to be a very, very quality defense. But they will love to have him back in December if he can, in fact, stay on target and come back for the playoffs, get well soon, Jalen Ramsey. Because, again, I like seeing great players play football. It sucks when they can't because of injuries. So, yeah, I would love to see Jalen Ramsey out there as soon as possible as long as he is healthy. Got two more headlines up here first. First, Buda Baker got a pay bump this year uh, and next season to make him happy. He'll be with the Cardinals. I honestly forgot that he was holding out. So, good for them. They're still going to suck hot, stinky, dirty ass this year. I mean, the, the, the I would be abjectly shocked if they were not a top five pick this year. That Cardinals team stinks, and it stinks like hot trash on a 100-degree day. They are not very good at all, but you got Buda Baker back, and he wants to be with the Cardinals for quite some time, so good for y'all. Good luck with that bullshit. Um... Final headline here, Vikings signed Daniel Hunter to a one-year deal, $20 million, $17 million of that guaranteed, other $3 million guarantees tied to sacks, tackles for loss, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> yep, that's, that's all that's going on right now. Bless me. If you're at home, just go out there and bless me because I could be dying right now. You never know when a sneeze comes on. But yeah, uh, Daniel Hunter was holding in, which just means he was showing up to practice or showed up to the facility, wasn't on the field at all until he got a new deal, was either going to be traded or got a new deal. Thankfully for the Vikings, they got a deal done. Love to have the Neil Hunter back out there. He's staying in Minnesota for at least another season. Hopefully he gets an extension come this offseason. Go away, Adobe Creative Cloud. I'll deal with you later, you fat sack of shit. I don't want to I don't want to deal with that right now. Thank you. Thank you for going going away right there. But that's all we got for headlines right now. Only a, a quick 30 minutes into the podcast. My goodness, this is going to take forever. But with that, let's uh, let's hop into the AFC West, shall we? No, no dilly dallying needed to happen right here. Let's just go. Whew, I am spicy today. Just took a quick hit of CBD that'll maybe chill me out a little bit, man. Just just chill me out. We're coming off a of vacation. We're we're having good times together, right? We're talking about sports. What what could be bad in the world right now? Let's just let's just talk about the AFC West, shall we? Let's start off with the Chiefs going down the division standings here. And I could pretty much just sum this up by saying the Chiefs is the Chiefs. And that would that would pretty much be my analysis, because that's that's what they are. The, the Chiefs is the Chiefs. Do they still got Andy Reid? Do they still got Patrick Mahomes? Do they still got Travis Kelsey? Chris Jones? Yeah, on all fronts, they'll be right there in the AFC, right at the top of the AFC once again, maybe even hosting uh, all the playoff games because they are the one seed with a bye as well because that is just how dominant that core of stars is, particularly the Reed and Mahomes duo. That's, I probably don't need to say more, but I'm gonna because it's a show and we got it, we got it hours to well not out hopefully not multiple hours but we got minutes to fill here so let's let me expand on that worth mentioning like i said before chris jones has been holding out looking for a, a new deal uh things could conceivably get ugly however like i said fifty thousand dollars a day that he's not there financially prohibitive to hold out in this new cba so even without a deal i would expect him to be there maybe he's a little bit of a malcontent but he will be there sooner or later, so I'm not ultra worried about it. As long as he's out there, they should have a quality defense. I mean, not the best defense in the entire league, but it hasn't been literally the entire time uh, that they've been on this dominant run that they've been on, so doesn't really matter. As long as you've got a star up front in uh, Chris Jones to push the pocket, cause some pressure, got a solid secondary back there, should be all right in the offense. I don't need to say shit about the offense. They are, the Chiefs is the Chiefs, and that should tell you just about all you need to know about what the offense has been and will be going forward. But with that, let's look at the personnel, shall we? Head on over to the old camera roll here. Talking about the draft first off. In the first round, last pick of the first round, because you may remember they won the damn Super Bowl last year. Uh, the Kansas City Chiefs took Kansas State defensive end Felix Anadike Uzama. 
Uh, then they took in the second round Rashi Rice, a guy you're going to be hearing a lot about this year. I think they'll probably use him pretty heavily, especially with the weapons they lost in free agency. Offensive tackle Wanya Morris they took in the third round. Might see him a little bit with the turnover at the tackles this year. Not really sure what's going to go on there. Might see Wanya Morris at some point there. Fourth round, they get uh, Shamari Connor, Virginia Tech uh, safety. Outside of that, you don't even know who Shamari Connor is. Hell, you don't even know who Wanya Morris is, if I'm, I'm being completely honest, unless you are just dialed in to college football. So, yeah, that, that's that's their draft right now. Maybe you see some guys uh, later in the draft pop up, popping up. Uh, but, you know, as far as the top three are concerned, those are probably the ones you're going to be seeing the most out of. Uh, Rashi Rice, first and foremost, Felix Anadike Uzama uh, in the first round, and Wanya Morris, that offensive tackle they got in the third round. That's basically uh, the draft this year that's going to have, um, or the draft picks this year that are going to have a bit of an impact, either positive or negative. It's going to be worth noting either way. Let's look at the free agency, shall we? Because it was a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, first off, sign Jawan Taylor. He will play right tackle this year. I, that's a He's coming over from the Jacksonville Jaguars. They signed him like four years, $80 million guaranteed. I want to say $60 million of that was, or $80 million overall, $60 million of, the, dollars of that was guaranteed. Not going to go through the money on all these, just, you know, Big time deal there for Juwan Taylor. Um, Orlando Brown, they lost in free agency to the Cincinnati Bengals. He'll play left tackle for them now after being a consummate pro bowler there with the Kansas City Chiefs over the last couple years. Uh, Juju Smith-Schuster, he's gone. He's gone to New England now. Uh, Andrew Wiley, uh, I believe he played right tackle for them last year opposite of Orlando Brown. He's now gone to the Washington Commies over there with the new, new owner, Josh Harris. Um... That's a tough one to lose, too. I mean, you're losing both your left tackle and your right tackle. Yes, you sign a big-time uh, tackle in free agency uh, in Juwan Taylor. They also sign Donovan Smith to replace Orlando Brown over there, who was, I mean, coming over from Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay did not really have a great offensive line, and Donovan Smith was part of that not-so-great offensive line. Yes, he was injured last year, but he's kind of getting up there in years, too, so this might just be the reality of dealing with injuries every year. You hope not, but... If he is healthy, maybe he can still provide some juice there. Maybe not quite to the level of Orlando Brown, uh, but maybe maybe a good little facsimile there. They signed him in free agency to a one-year uh, one deal. Uh, kind of underrated signing. Uh, Big-time hitter tra tackling machine Drew Tranquil comes over from the L.A. Chargers in the division. Uh, also, they lose Nicole Harbin to the New York Jets. That, that, that's tough for them. Uh, they lose Frank Clark to the, the uh, Denver Broncos. Kalen Saunders, defensive tackle, de tackle there in the middle. He goes over to the New Orleans Saints. Uh, they do bring in Charles Amenahu from the, the San Francisco 49ers, part of that loaded front seven over there. Uh, they also lose safety uh, Juan, Horn Juan Thornhill, though, uh, in free agency to the Cleveland Browns. So, um, outside of that, they bring in Justin, or they, they retain Justin Watson on a two year deal. Uh, Mike Edwards, they bring in as safety to kind of fill in the gaps that Juan Thornhill left. Uh, they retain Nick Allegretti, Jarek McKinnon, they retain Blaine Gabbert, uh, they bring in from Tampa Bay, Dion Bush, they retain, um, I believe, I think they might have cut Dion Bush, actually, I can't, I can't quite remember, I, I digress, though, they lose Michael Burton to the Denver Broncos, though, they're, that's their starting fullback there, and they also bring in Richie James, that's basically uh, a wide receiver from New York Giants, he was basically their number one last year when they were just starting Century High School starting three wide receivers out there for a period of time with the New York Giants, but still, speedy return, fumbles the hell out of the ball way too much, but is a guy that can, you know, create, create some plays after the catch, a guy that, you know, streaking deep could catch a couple of those deep balls from Pat Mahomes this year. That's basically what the additions were, draft and free agency included. Let's look at the depth chart, shall we? First off, uh, they are starting Blaine Gabbard. At, no, they're not. They're starting Pat Mahomes at quarterback there uh, with uh, good old Shane Bouchelle as the third string. Who cares? Not me. Okay. Uh, running back, still Isaiah Pacheco with Jarek McKinnon being the second string. Clyde Edwards-Alaire still on the team. Shocking to me. Did not know Clyde Edwards-Alaire was still on the team, but he's the third string running back at this point. Uh, wide receivers, 
Uh, this is one I forgot to mention. Kadarius Tony actually tweaked his knee um, early on in training camp. Don't know if that'll be a factor, but always seems to be a little bit injured. He's currently slated as their number one receiver, which would give me pause, would kind of scare me a little bit if I were a Chiefs fan, but you have Patrick Mahomes, so... He's done more with less in the past. I'll just put it to you that way. Uh, Marquez Valdez Scanling is still there. He'll be the, slotted as the second receiver right now. And Sky Moore has been getting a, a lot of praise in camp coming into his second year. Uh, he will be playing the third receiver. Probably, I mean, he's a big-time speed guy. guy that they're going to use in a lot of creative, fun ways, I would imagine. So he... Prime for a breakout year, though. I don't, know, I don't know if I pick him up in fantasy right away, but prime for a breakout year, it seems like. Uh, and, of course, you got Rashi Rice uh, that I just talked about out of SMU. He's been getting a lot of run in training camp, apparently. He's been apparently playing very well in practice. Practice, again, for whatever it's worth. But if, if Pat Mahomes likes him, might have a breakout year in his rookie year. Might come out of nowhere for some people, though he was drafted in the second round, so he didn't exactly come out of nowhere. But uh, a guy that could break onto the scene very quickly, climb up this depth chart uh, in short order if he plays well early. Uh, and of course, Richie James, Justin Watson, who they re-signed. That that's basically uh, your your contributing wide receivers. Maybe you get a maybe you get a Justin Ross in there every once in a while, but that that's basically what you're looking at there uh, for the wide receiver core. Um, tight end Travis Kelsey. Duh, who else would it be there? The Hall of Fame type of guy. Why would why would they go in any other direction? Uh, and on an offensive line. Donovan Smith at left tackle, Joe Tooney returning at left guard, Creed Humphrey returning at center, uh, Trey Smith, I believe, returning as well at right guard. So, hey, if nothing else, you retain the interior of the offensive line, so quick pressure kind of out of the question there, which is good, which is good. You got uh, the big-time free agent, Jawan Taylor, coming in at right tackle, too, and did play very, very well at right tackle for the, the uh, Jacksonville Jaguars. So... Can't blame him. Can't blame him there. Uh, and uh, not, overall, geez, just kicking around my computer. What am I doing? Uh, Donovan Smith is a question mark. But outside of that, I mean, you look at it, they did lose both their starting uh, tackles last year. But Juwan Taylor, very good stepping in there at, at right tackle. So... I think you're I think you're okay there with that replacement there of uh, I believe it's Andrew Wiley they lost in in the off season. Um, interior of the offensive line all returning from last year and they played very well last year. I mean as long as Donovan Smith plays well, this is still a very good offensive line and overall the offense. Pat Mahomes at quarterback, he'll make it work with the wide receivers. He got a good physical young back in Isaiah Pacheco that brings a little bit of extra uh, oomph and emphasis, a physical presence that they necessarily did not have going into last year uh, in the backfield. And also Jarek McKinnon, uh, the consummate pro, a guy just sticks around year after year. Uh, maybe the oldest running back left in the NFL right now. I mean, he just finds ways to stick around and uh, be that versatile guy that I, I love to watch out there. Um, but I mean, overall, this offense, as long as you got Pat Mahomes there, he'll make all that stuff work. You got a good offensive line. This is going to be one of the better offenses in the NFL once again this year. I can just book it, guaranteed. It's going to happen that way. Um, on the defensive side of the ball, got uh, last year's first round pick, George Karloftis, starting at left defensive end. Derek Nottie and Chris Jones in the middle there, assuming Chris Jones reports, which I assume so. Uh, and then Charles Amena, who you bring in in free agency at right defensive end. Felix Anadike Uzama is still there uh, as backup um, uh, depth. That That's the word I was looking for at the right defensive end spot. Uh, at the linebackers, you got Willie Gay, Nick Bolton, Drew Tranquil. As far as a bunch of hitting, mean cusses, love to see it. Um, Nick Bolton and Willie Gay played very well last year. Nick, uh, Drew Tranquil, kind of a question mark in the, the cover department. He, maybe he'll pick it up. Maybe it'll do uh, okay this season. Uh, maybe Nick Bolton and Willie Gay will be good enough that Drew Tranquil can just go out there and be an absolute animal when you need him to. We'll, we'll have to see how it works out there for him. Uh, solid front seven, though. Not necessarily the biggest pass rushers outside of Chris Jones in that front seven, but, I mean, solid overall with uh, as far as quality of player across the board uh, is concerned. In the secondary... Last year's first round pick, um, or I guess George Karloffis was two years ago. Last year's was Trent McDuffie. 
They played well last year, returning at uh, left cornerback there for him. At least that's probably the depth chart is on ESPN. I don't, I don't really know. Uh, strong safety, Justin Reed returning. And uh, new free safety, they bring in brand new Brian Cook. Also, Deion Bush, fun fact, is still in KC. That's, you know, had some questions about that earlier. It's only because I'm stupid. It is what it is. Um, Brian Cook, though, stepping in there at free safety. Lots of questions. You got Mike, Mike Edwards. Uh, chomping at his heels right now, nipping at his heels, whatever the phrase is over there, um, right behind him though. So if Brian Cook doesn't play well, Mike Edwards could step in pretty easily there. And then of course you got Legereus Sneed, uh, your number one cornerback over there on the other side of Trent McDuffie. I mean, again, you got to be concerned about the pass rush a little bit. It's not necessarily the greatest in the world, but outside of that, I mean, a solid group of personnel there for the Kansas City Chiefs. Steve Spagnola returning back as the defensive coordinator uh, for several years now there in Kansas City. Not a bad group here on the other side of the ball. And, of course, I, you know, specialists, I haven't really been getting into these, but, you know, Harry Butts, Harrison Butker, uh, you know, Tommy Townsend at kicker and punter, respectively. Uh, that's, you know, that's all you really need to know there. They're, they're solid across the board, just about every single area. So with all of that said, I think their floor is 11 wins. Very worst case scenario, assuming that Patrick Mahomes doesn't get hurt. You want, you understand that much, but I mean, even if all goes wrong, if Donovan Smith doesn't come out there and play well, if he just doesn't look like he's got any juice anymore, um, if if the receivers really are just like not flashy enough to get the job done, maybe uh, you see a few more turnovers that are maybe on wide receivers from that wide receiving core uh, as far as interceptions are concerned for Pat Mahomes and lack of explosive plays. Even with all of that, you still got Patrick Mahomes as your QB. You got an okay, solid, better than okay, a solid defense on the other side of the ball. Be wary that maybe the Steve Spagnuolo defense won't play well early in the season because it's basically what happens every single season. But it always plays well down the stretch. Um, this team is 11 wins at the very worst. They're going to be in the in the hunt for the division, probably in the hunt for a, a one seed and a bye when it's all said and done. But even at 11 and six, they'll be they'll be well within playoffs, um, no matter what, pretty much. Unless Pat Mahomes does get hurt, it, it, there's always that caveat there. I don't. I hope not. Knock on wood. I don't think it's going to happen. But that's like worst case scenario there, as long as he's still in the lineup. Uh, ceiling for me, 14 wins. Yeah, you know, see Andy Reid, Pat Mahomes. That That's pretty much uh, par for the course. They've been right around 13, 14 wins every year, basically, since Pat Mahomes ha has started for them. So not really, not really news there. I, I just feel like this team is every bit as good as it has been in previous years. At, at their ceiling, I still don't know. I mean, it's hard to go undefeated in, a, in an NFL season. I don't think they have a roster that is necessarily that. They're not like that that Patriots team, that 08 Patriots, 07 Patriots. I can't remember exactly which year it was. That just absolutely ran through the league like a hot knife through butter. They don't have they don't have got they don't got a Randy Moss on this team for Pat Mahomes to throw to is what I'm saying. But 14 wins, they could be right there at the top of the league once again and my prediction overall 13 and 4 that feels like the number the, the sweet number for me so long as Pat Mahomes doesn't get hurt I expect them to be every bit as dominant as they have been over the past several years there since the Reed Mahomes regime truly started again as long as Mahomes stays healthy the league runs through Kansas City as far as I'm concerned Up next, up next, we have got the Chargers, and you know what? They're pretty good. They're, they're pretty good, man. You know, they made the playoffs last year, uh, so that's progress. The problem is they lost to the Jags, uh, and in the most Chargers way of all time, uh, once they got there, I mean, they gave up like a 20-some point lead, uh, were absolutely dominating the Jaguars at one point. And then they just chargers it up 
so, so bad. Uh, and that's how it ended last year. Kind of a flawed roster, uh, a flawed coaching group. Still got all the questions in the world about Brandon Staley, but they only got better this offseason. That being said, they, they finally parted ways with offensive coordinator Joe Lombardi, which the time had come there. He played well in his rookie year, uh, but the scheme wasn't really great. It, it doesn't didn't really emphasize the best aspects of the players, and the players, quite frankly, uh, were in the, in the wide receiver core on paper. It looked good, but they were all injured, and man... It just didn't work out last year. Obviously, uh, Justin Herbert was spectacular in, in points, but there's only so much you can do when your receiving core just simply isn't cutting. I'm sorry, I keep moving around the camera. I apologize for that. I don't. I don't mean to. It just it just kind of happens that way. But they bolstered the the weapons as well uh, on offense. Bolstered the defense to go with that. Uh, kind of shed some of the older players. Got Kellen Moore in there, an offensive coordinator, obviously, to spice things up on that offensive side of the ball. Signed Justin Herbert to a shiny new extension uh, that'll that'll keep him with the team for another five years after this one. Uh, I think by maybe next one. No, no, no. Just that. Well, I have no idea, honestly. I'm I'm talking out of my ass. I'm I'm really just I'm struggling here. I'm on the struggle bus. We've hit that wall. It's about. Just before eight o'clock, I've I've been up since seven. I have uh, I've been at work for for nine hours. Well, at work for eight hours. You know, our, our unpaid lunch. You know how it is out there in the struggle bus life. But uh, it's now seven forty-seven. A uh, almost two hours after I've I've left work. And man, hitting a wall, folks. Hitting a wall. But the Chargers, as far as what they were compared to to last year, they kept the core together. Uh, they kept it all kind of kind of contained, moving as a team there, and then they just kind of improved on top of that. So, uh, bring in that new offensive coordinator, get some new players in there. I think this team is looking pretty good. Also, not to mention, uh, Rashawn Slater was out all of last year. Um, one of the best offensive tackles in the entire game when he's out there. So, it, you're getting Rashawn Slater back. That's going to make the entire offensive line better. And they were already good being back there with uh, with Austin Eckler. So let's just get straight into the personnel, shall we? I've I have woefully underprepared for this podcast, but we're we're just gritting through it here, folks. <clears throat> Whew, gotta clear my throat there. But in the first round of the draft, starting off with, kind of just rolled into that, they got Quentin Johnson, speedster, shifty after the catch. Love that addition for him. He'll be a great third guy to add in with Mike Williams and Keenan Allen when they're all healthy. That is just going to be a fun, fun group to watch, especially with Justin Herbert throwing them the ball. Kellen Moore drawing up some plays for him. It's going to be electric. Uh, Tuli to a polo too easy for me to say. You say it at home for me. Uh, USC outside linebacker is their second round pick. They add him uh, at an area of need on that defense where they also added Eric Kendricks in free agency. I, I miss you. Goodbye, sweet prince. Uh, but I hope you do great things with the LA Chargers. Solid outside linebacker or just linebacker group in general, which we're going to talk about here in just a bit. Inside linebacker, they draft out of Washington State, uh, Diane Henley. In the third round, they get Darius Davis. Uh, may remember him from TCU, wide receiver in the fourth round that they add to that group. Bit of a deep threat sort of guy that they can kind of lean on as well. They got basically the two best receivers at TCU last year in Quentin Johnson and Darius Davis. So Tom Telesco seemed to enjoy that offense, I suppose. Um, after that, uh, they got Max Duggan. Just add to the TCU, shall we? They must have some weird uh, interpersonal relationship with all those guys. I mean, it makes sense, I suppose, if you're drafting uh, Darius Davis and Quentin Johnston who Max Duggan already had a built-in sort of rapport with, um, you're, you always hope that the starter doesn't get... You, you, you just paid Justin Herbert, by God. You don't want him to get hurt. But if he does, might as well have a guy in there that has some, uh, has some rapport with guys that you just drafted. But th uh, three... Uh, of the, let me see, seven. Yep, they got seven draft picks. That's Mass B. Uh, three of the seven draft picks uh, of uh, the LA Chargers this, this season were from TCU offense alone. Three of the 11 starters were drafted by one team on TCU. I mean, wild, wild, wild stuff there. But that is the draft for the LA Chargers. The free agency. <clears throat> Whew, excuse me. 
they bring in. That's disgusting. Uh, Trey Pipkins, that's not disgusting. That's a good pick. Well, they, they keep Trey Pipkins, rather, uh, to, to do tackle. To do the tackle opposite of Rashawn Slater this year, That's that can only help them. Uh, young guy re-signing on a three-year deal. Eric Kendricks, they bring in uh, at a position of need linebacker there. Uh, Morgan Fox, they, they retain as well. J.K. Scott, the punter over there, they retain. Drew Tranquil, just talked about him. He, they did lose him to the Kansas City Chiefs this year. Uh, Donald Parham, uh, he, they keep him in town. Backup tight end over there uh, behind Gerald Everett. Uh, Matt Filer. Inside, inside, you know, interior lineman guard, they will lose to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. DeAndre Carter, they lost to the Las Vegas Raiders. Jalen Guyton, they retained. Troy Reader, they lose to my boys, the Minnesota Vikings. I actually kind of like that pickup, but they, they got him on the Chiefs, too. So uh, hopefully he'll play and be an absolute animal for us this year over on Skull Nation. Uh, but Nick Williams, they bring over defensive tackle from the L.A. Chargers. Will Clapp, they, they, they retain. Uh, Christian Covington, they lose to the Detroit Lions outside of that. Uh, they lose Storm Norton to the New Orleans Saints, which I don't think they're necessarily too broken up about that. And, uh, yeah, that, that pretty much pretty much tells you what the additions were right there between the draft and free agency. So let's crack open the depth chart. First off, you got Justin Herbert starting quarterback, Austin Eckler running back, uh, Keenan Allen, Mike Williams, Quentin Johnson are your wide receivers with Gerald Everett at the tight end position. Pretty solid receiving group there, assuming they all stay healthy. But if, if not, you do got Joshua Palmer, Jalen Guyton, and Darius Davis there. But Jalen Guyton has a big old O next to his name, so maybe he's on the pup list. I don't know. I, I don't really know right now, folks. Uh, I didn't do enough uh, research for this. But that's the receiver's. That's the uh, the offensive skill positions. As far as the skill positions goes, some of the some of the better uh, players in the league, better groups in the league, if I would say so. Kellen Moore's got a lot to work with. I'll just put it that way. And in front of that group, you've got left tackle Rashawn Slater. Hopefully, he stays healthy. He's spectacular as that left tackle when he's out there. Zion Johnson, I believe, last year's first round pick, still in there, stud. Corey Lindsley still at center. Jamari Sawyer at right guard. And you got Trey Pipkins at right tackle. That's your offense. And overall, like I said, Kellen Moore's got a lot to work with. Uh, I didn't even mention the backfield. They still got Joshua Kelly there. They still got Isaiah Spiller. Uh, deep group of backs. Austin Eckler there as well. One of the better running backs in the entire league. I mean, scored a bazillion touchdowns last year. This is a good offense. This, as long as Kellen Moore utilizes the pieces properly, which I have no reason to suspect he won't, this is going to be a fun offense to watch. I think you're going to see a lot more deep shots from Justin Herbert this year, assuming the health of this team, which you never know. Knock on wood, like I've said before, uh, hopefully they all stay healthy. On the defensive side of the ball, uh, running a 3-4 defense this year under... Uh, I mean, same defensive guy. It, it's still uh, the the head coach over there whose name escapes me after talking about him. Or Brandon Staley, yeah, it's his defensive scheme over there, three four right now. Uh, Morgan Fox, uh, Austin Johnson, who is currently out for whatever reason, and Sebastian Sebastian Joseph Day are the first three. And then at outside linebackers, you got Joey Boza, Khalil Mack, one of the more potent pass rushing duos in the league. You just hope that uh, uh, maybe Khalil Mack can do a little bit more in the run defense than he did last year. Don't want to besmirch anyone, but the numbers were not kind to the boy. Uh, Eric. Kendricks and Kenneth Murray in the middle there, kind of patrolling. Good group of backers there. Okay, front seven. I mean, no no names really going to wow you outside of like Joey Boza. Um, maybe Khalil Mack if you if you're a, a fan of a certain age. Not too long ago that Khalil Mack was a, an elite sort of player, so don't have to have been around long, but. Not the greatest front seven in the world. I mean, behind them, you got Derwin James, Alohi, uh, Aloha to Alohi coming into the starting lineup, Alohi Gilman. Don't know a damn thing about him, but wish nothing but uh, peace and prosperity for him. Hope it's all good. J.C. Jackson returning back from an injury-plagued season last year where he didn't even get on the field. Hopefully uh, he can get out there and ball out. like they, they paid him like he should, so hopefully he gets out there, plays well. Then you got Asante Samuel Jr. on the other side. Michael Davis, uh, Jasir Taylor are the depth there at your quarterback. Overall, I mean... 
not terrible defense, I suppose. It's not a defense that really uh, strikes me as a, like, wow, they could be really good this year. Uh, I think they could be middle of the pack. I don't think they're the greatest defense in the entire... They're not the 85 Bears, that's that's for damn sure. Uh, but I don't know, maybe they can play well. I'm st Again, I'm not really sold on what Brandon Saley is trying to pitch me here, so... I'm, I'm skeptical to say the least. The Chargers kind of is the Chargers in my mind. Uh, but let's look at the ceiling here, or the floor. Well, yeah, let's, let's start with the floor first. I didn't really think this out. I didn't, didn't really plan nearly well enough for this podcast this time around. So um, as far as the floor is concerned, they could be an 8-9 team once again. I mean, it's this is the Chargers here. They could very easily... Uh, Miss expectations. Hell, they just did last year. They they just missed people's expectations last year. So why would I think that they would uh, be above doing that once again? Yes, they got Justin Herbert. Yes, they got all the weapons you can want on the offensive side of the ball. The defense could very easily be just as bad as they were at times last year. So who's to say eight wins? Probably the floor for this team. The ceiling, though, I'm still probably going to say is like 12. I mean. Justin Herbert is a very, very good quarterback. If he just has an offensive coordinator that can unlock some of that, a little bit more of that potential, I mean, this offense could be very, very good. Uh, this quarterback could get them through a lot of games, uh, get them to a lot of wins, in fact. I like this team. It's just they're wearing Chargers uniforms is the problem. Like, if they were wearing some other uniforms, maybe I would expect a little more of them, but they're wearing the Chargers uniforms. They're not exactly sold on Brandon Staley. Overall, my prediction's probably like 10 and 7, 11 and 6. I do think they will be in the playoff hunt. I think they'll get a playoff spot when it's all said and done. But I don't, I don't know how good they are. It's, it's, it's the Chargers. I don't know, man. Who, if you're very sure on what the Chargers are going to be, you should rethink your levels of surety because you could never be sure with the Chargers. The Chargers have been the Chargers since the Chargers were first the Chargers. And if that didn't make sense to you. Join the club. I'm just kind of saying words at this point, but my prediction for the season is probably 10 and 7, 11 and 6. Let's get to the bottom half of the division, shall we? And I'll try to make this quick because we're we're already over an hour, baby. We are cruising into the hour territory, and I just want to keep this as brief as humanly possible without boring y'all to tears. Uh, so the Raiders. This team looks remarkably similar to the one that we had last season, if not a, a little bit worse in some areas. Um, at least Jimmy G passed the physical. That's, that's good. Good for him. He gets money now. Um, you may remember at, at one point in the offseason, he, he signed a deal that uh, when you go back and look at the language, if you don't pass the physical on the opening day, they can just cut you. I mean, oh, he is zero dollars and zero cents. Uh, that can, that kind of gives you the full picture of um, what the injury history is like there for Jimmy G. He's always got something every year. I mean, his 70s, I mean, he's gonna look fan. He's gonna look absolutely fantastic. I mean, he can't help but doing so. He's just a, a good-looking, attractive man. Is Jimmy G? Uh, he's gonna be walking with a walker though when he's fifty. I mean, he is. He's gonna be banged up in his later years, but he's making all sorts of money now. So good for him. Uh, but he's in there at quarterback. Uh, they just signed Marcus Peters uh, in free agency, uh, late in the free agency cycle. I've really started camp pretty much, not even the free agency cycle anymore. Um, so they bring him in there. Um, Derek Carr's out of town. Jimmy G is in town. Is that an upgrade? No. Feels kind of like the Spider-Man meme to me. I mean, they're kind of different types of players. I mean, Derek Carr kind of threw it up a little bit more uh, to Devontae Adams than I think Jimmy G probably will. Uh, but as far as, like, level of QB goes, it's it's the Spider-Man meme. I mean, they're not... We're all the same here. We're not we're not really different, you and I, uh, between Derek Carr and Jimmy G. I, I just don't know if this team is that good. It's not really uh, something that screams to me great, but let's look at the personnel to find out, though, shall we? Uh, first off, in the draft, they get Tyree Wilson, a 7 overall defensive end. He was getting some buzz as far as the, the physical traits uh, he's bringing in. He's still out with a foot injury, so hopefully, uh, I believe it's a foot injury. I, I could be wrong on that. Don't quote me. I'm not a doctor. Um, 
You hope he's back in there. If you got Tyree Wilson and Max Crosby, that's a, that's a solid duo uh, to go with. I mean, I hopefully Chandler Jones plays well. I don't know. He's kind of he's good for at least one like five sack game a year, and then probably won't get a sack for you for another month and a half after that. So um, I don't know. I, I don't really know, but I, we'll just keep it moving from there. Second round, they get Michael Mayer, tight end out of Notre Dame. Didn't test well at all physically. I mean, not the not the most smooth athlete of all time. All he did was just go up and absolutely out physical people at the point of attack. Caught just about everything that that was in his radius. Uh, the combine is not an event for a man like Michael Mayer. He is a fantastic tight end, and I think he's going to do a lot for him uh, this year in the absence of Darren Waller uh, for the Las Vegas Raiders. Uh, they t- take up uh, Bra- Byron Young, easy for me to say, defensive tackle out of Alabama in the third round. Uh, they get uh, wide receiver Trey Tucker out of Cincinnati in the third as well. Uh, Jacorian Bennett, fast, fast cornerback. Al Davis would be proud of this pick. They get him in the fourth round out of Maryland. He should get a lot of playing time because the secondary is still a problem. We'll talk about that in here in just a second. Uh, they get uh, Purdue quarterback Aiden O'Connell, who put up big-time numbies uh, in his college career in the fourth round as well. Uh, Christopher Smith at safety and Amari Burnley uh, at uh, outside linebacker. Christopher Smith, by the way, of that uh, vaunted Georgia defense last year, one of the bajillion players on that team uh, to be drafted over the last two years. So that's that's basically... That, that's basically your uh, your draft there for the Las Vegas Raiders. Let's look at the free agency. That's the word I was looking for there. Uh, Derek Carr, lose him in free agency, but you cut him anyways. Doesn't matter. Uh, Jimmy Garoppolo comes in uh, out of San Francisco. We all know that story there. Maybe you'll see Aiden O'Connell at some point this year. Just a thought. Just a thought. Uh, Jacoby Myers, they bring it out of New England. They sign him in free agency to kind of fill the role that Mac Hollins kind of left there. Uh, solid pickup. Kind of maintains the level of this group. Very solid wide receiver group. We'll talk about them in a bit. Uh, they lose Foster Moreau to New Orleans uh, this offseason. That's kind of the, your second string tight end who played well for them uh, in the blocking game. And in the passing game, when he, whenever he was called on, uh, safety Marcus Epps you bring in from the Philadelphia Eagles. He started for a good bit of last year because I believe he uh, C.J. Gardner Johnson uh, was out and he was his backup. I want to say I could totally be wrong on that, which I am quite frequently, but that's that's what I think it is, anyways. I uh, got Jared Stidham. Uh, going over to the Denver Broncos, you lose him this offseason. Uh, Robert Spillane, big-time hitter you bring in from Pittsburgh. Don't know about the covered skills, but he'll hit the shit out of you. Uh, Jared Tillery you keep around. Uh, Brandon Faison, cornerback they bring over from the Indianapolis Colts. Not a secondary I'd love to dip into, but beggars can't be choosers, I guess. Uh, Brian Hoyer reunites with Josh McDaniels, comes over from New England on a two-year deal. Uh, Rocky Sin, they lost to Baltimore on a one-year deal. He was, I mean, one of their better uh, corners. I mean, they traded for him last year, so you'd hope he's one of your better corners. He goes over to Baltimore this year. Uh, Jake and Bo- Jacob Bob and Moyer. What a name. Long snapper. Uh, they lose him in free agency on a three-year deal. Actually, no, they bring him in on free agency. Excuse me. Got my things mixed up here. They bring in, bring in old Bob and Moyer uh, over from the Denver Broncos. He goes from uh, shooting his... Uh, what, what am I even talking about there? He goes from shooting that snap back there to the punter and the kicker. Really, the punter both times because the punter's doing the holding on the on the kicks too. You get it. You get it. He goes from Denver Broncos to the Las Vegas Raiders on a three-year deal. Good old Bob and Moore are going to do big things there in Las Vegas. And I'm not just talking about the partying. Uh, Jermaine uh, Illuminor, that's where we're at right now. Right tackle Las Vegas Raiders, they retain him. Uh, they bring in Austin Hooper as well. Andrew Billings, left tackle, they lose in free agency. Denzel Perryman, tackling machine. They lose him in free agency to the Houston Texans. Um, Matt Collins just talked about they lost him to the Atlanta Falcons. Cleveland Farrell, they lost to the San Francisco 49ers. I don't know if they necessarily wanted him back. So, uh, got paid somewhere. There's so, those are good for him. And uh, Jacob Johnson, they retain at fullback. And with that, those are your personnel additions. Let's go to the depth chart. First off, Jimmy Garoppolo starting at quarterback. Brian Hoyer is the second string. Aiden O'Connell, the third string. But 
I mean, what are you going to learn about Brian Hoyer? I guess he'll be a good backup for you, but why not just go with Aiden O'Connell if you can? I mean, it could be fun. It could be fun. You know, you're probably going to see him at some point because Jimmy Garoppolo being Jimmy Garoppolo and this offensive line being uh, left tackle Colton Miller, Don, Dylan Parham at left guard, Andre James at center, Alex Bars right guard, and Jermaine Illuminor, who did they just signed on basically a league minimum one-year deal. So... When you got that going for you in front of you, yeah, I think Jimmy G is going to probably be uh, on the on the old, I don't want to say IR because that implies long-term stuff. He's going to have some dinks, going to have some cuts and bruises this year, if you will. Um, he's thrown to a good group of receivers, though, if he can stay upright. Devontae Adams, Jacoby Myers, Hunter Renfro are your top three. Great pairing of, uh, of talents there. Um, maybe not quite... What the uh, you know Darren Waller being in there last year would equate to, but still you got Devontae Adams, Jacoby Myers compliments Devontae Adams really well, and then Hunter Renfro he can be your move the sticks type of guy. Good group of receivers. Uh, got DeAndre Carter over from uh, the in interdivision rivals, uh, the Los Angeles Chargers. Almost said Las Vegas Chargers. That would have been weird. It would have been weird stuff, right? Um, uh, DeAndre Carter is still got back there. Uh, Keelan Cole. Um, then Michael Mayer being the backup tight end, which kind of surprised me. I thought he'd kind of start from day one. Tight end transition is a little bit weird, though, into the NFL. They don't generally put up big numbers right away. So, I mean, you'll probably see a lot of him towards the end of the season. Um, Austin Hooper, not a bad tight end, not a guy that you're really expecting to be that number one for you as long as Michael Mayer turns out as uh, expected, though. Uh, still got fullback Jacob Johnson there, and with that, that is your uh, that's your offense for the Las Vegas Raiders, and not a great offensive line, good receivers, middling quarterback, great running back in Josh Jacobs, great, great running back in Josh Jacobs, who may not be there, by the way, Zamir White is the backup there right now, between him and Amir Abdullah, you have to figure it out if Josh Jacobs isn't there, but Good weapons, middling QB, bad offensive line. Feels a lot like the analysis I had of this team last year. Does not feel like a whole lot has uh, changed on that offense. And, then, you know, maybe they'll be okay. Maybe they'll be middling, if you will. Maybe they'll even be a little bit better than last year. I don't see them being a very good offense, though. Uh, when it, I don't see them being an elite offense when it's all said done. Maybe they're middle of the pack. I could kind of see that happening, but eh. Don't don't feel great about this Raiders offense. Uh, the defense, I probably feel even more uh, more uh, trepidatious about. Uh, you got Max Crosby, which great, fantastic pass rusher over there, one of the best in the entire league. Uh, on the left side, I got Chandler Jones on the right. Tyree Wilson out right now, but expect to see him at some point, assuming he gets healthy. Then in the middle, you got you, you got your uh, Bilal Nichols, uh, Jerry Tillery there for now. Not a terrible front four, but not a front four that's scaring a whole lot of people either. Uh, linebackers, you got Divine Diablo, Robert Spillane, and uh, Luke Masterson. So overall, the front seven, I don't know most of those names. I, well, the, I know the front four. Um, I know Divine Diablo is is young, I suppose. I don't know. I don't know a damn thing about this, uh, this, this uh, front seven. I don't think they're uh, necessarily the greatest in the world either. Uh, as far as the... Whew, secondary, that's the word. As far as the secondary goes, you got Nate Hobbs, uh, Marcus Epps at strong safety, Tr Trayvon Merrig at free safety, and Marcus Peters stepping in. Not great when you got a guy stepping in off the street uh, on a one-year deal right at training camp start, uh, and he's your he's your number one corner. But that is the situation that the uh, that the the Raiders are in, and you know what? Not a great one to be in. You got Duke Shelley back there, though, Viking fan favorite. Uh, Brandon Face on as well. So, I mean, hey, good good for y'all. Um, overall, this defense looks exactly like they did last year. Not very, I mean, not a very good secondary at all. I mean, Marcus Epps is going to be covering up holes all over the field in all likelihood. Um, not the greatest um, front seven either. I don't feel very great about this team overall. I don't feel great about the defense. I don't feel great about the offense. And for me, that basically tells me the uh, the floor, I'd say f five, six wins, 
something like that. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked at all if they went 6-11 and 11 this year with what they've got in there. I mean, Jimmy G, who knows if he's going to stay in the lineup. you got good receivers, uh, very good running back if he shows up. Um, but outside of that, what do you have? I mean, you got Max Crosby. That's that's good to have around. Don't get me wrong. But the entire defense around him is going to fail him in all likelihood. It's not going to be a group where the if, if your offense is off one day, I don't think defense is going to win a whole lot of games for you. And uh, as a result, if all goes wrong, 6-11 is not out of the question for me. Um, outside of that, on the ceiling side of things, you could still see him maybe get 10 wins. I mean... It's not totally out of the question if all goes haywire. Um, do I think they'll get 10 wins? No. But if you get lucky, you got a good group of players. Um, Jimmy G has been known to be clutch at times uh, with the San Francisco 49ers. Who's to say they can't pull off some games that um, that you necessarily would not have thought about in, in them winning in the first place? Who's to say that wouldn't happen? I, I don't know. They, they, could, they could do it. Don't think they will, but they could. My prediction... I think they'll be better than last year. I think they'll, you know, be 7 and 10, 8 and 9. You know, steady improvement if you will. I don't know if the roster is necessarily that much better, but you know, second year under that same regime. Um I think they brought in Patrick Graham too. Uh well, they brought in Patrick Graham last year and that didn't necessarily work out too well for him. So uh, we'll see. We'll have to see how this all works out. I don't see him being over 500, but you know, 7 and 10 Eight and nine wouldn't be a bad year for him when it's all said and done. And now, as we mercifully get to the final team here, let's talk about the Denver Broncos. Let me first wet the old whistle, if you will. Yep, probably going to be burping in a few seconds from that. <clears throat> yep. There it is. Hopefully that got through the worst of it. Well, let's talk about those Broncos now. The uh, the old whistle has been wetted, if you will. Not sure there's been a harder vibe shift for any team uh, from last year to this year than the Denver Broncos. I mean, they massively upgraded at, at head coach. Uh, they went from maybe the nicest guy in the league to a man that uh, pretty much openly said, man, that staff was terrible. I mean, I just... I, I, could, I could wash my asshole and then show you the water, and that's basically that's that's basically what you're talking about. The coaching job was last year. Um, I mean, great head coach, not the nicest guy in the world. You go the exact opposite of what it was last year with Nathaniel Hackett being an absolute saint of a human being, but just a terrible, terrible head coach when it was all said and done. Uh, man, this this team. I mean, the roster looked good last year. There's a re I mean, I really thought highly of them last year. I thought that that team, if it was coached properly, could have made some things happen. Who knows what's left in the tank for Russell Wilson? If there's anything left in the tank, though, a guy like Sean Payton is going to bring it out. I mean, make no mistake about it. I, he's going to do basically. He. I'm sure he's already found the greatest strengths of Russell Wilson's game at this point in his career, and he's going to do basically nothing but that, put him in the best possible situations to succeed, and he's going to do it behind the running game. Um, hopefully on the defensive side, they still play very well. They lost their defensive coordinator, but they have some great players over there uh, that will hopefully pick up the slack as well. This Broncos team for my money, should not be last place in the division this year. And with that, let's get into the personnel moves. We've got first off in the draft, uh, did not have a first-round pick because, you know, uh, they, they sent it over for Russell Wilson last season, uh, if you didn't hear about that. Um, Second-round pick, their first pick of the draft, they get Marvin Mims out of Oklahoma, solid receiver there. Um Played well in college last year when a lot of his team did not. He should be, he should get some good contributions this year in Sean Payton's offense. Uh, you draft Drew Sanders out of Arkansas. Pretty much the only good defensive player on that Arkansas team. That that team around him was abysmal on the defensive side of the ball. But his, the the offense or his his part in that defense certainly did not disappoint. He was one of the best players in the SEC at linebacker, uh, quarterback. Riley Moss out of Iowa they took in the third round. And if you want a fun little surprise, go Google Riley Moss and just be enamored 
at uh, what this guy looks like. Not what you expect out of a cornerback generally. So fun, fun to have a guy like that in there. Um, sixth round, who cares? Who cares? Basically, the, the, the draft is over for you uh, people at home after the third round. Uh, look forward to, to Riley Moss playing a, a big-time role on the other side of Patrick Sertain. All jokes aside, uh, hopefully he's going to be asked to be put in a spotlight right away. So hopefully he steps up and does big things. In free agency, what did they do in free agency? Well, first off, they bring in Mike McGlinchey, right tackle for the San Francisco 49ers, long-time right tackle for the San Francisco 49ers. Uh, he's going to step in for the Denver Broncos this year, probably be the linchpin of that offensive line. Uh, they lose Draymond Jones to the Seattle Seahawks, which stinks for that defense. Uh, another piece they lose, they do bring in Will Powers on the other side, guard out of Baltimore. They sign him to a big deal as well, just reshaping that offense. I keep bumping the camera. I'm sorry, guys. I, I'm sorry. I'm bad at this. I stink at what I'm doing right now. But uh, they also bring in Zach Allen uh, from the Arizona Cardinals as well, bring in, you know, Continuity there with the new defensive coordinator, Vance Joseph. He was there, I believe, every single year that Vance Joseph was there with the uh, Arizona Cardinals. So a guy that, solid player, you know what you're going to get from him, and he, he fits into the scheme well. You already knew that. Um, they retain Alex Singleton at linebacker. Ooh, excuse me. They lose, or they bring in Jared Stidham from the Las Vegas Raiders, who we talked about before. Crucially, they get Samaj P. Ryan out of free agency from the Cincinnati Bengals. Already have Javante Williams back in practice, looking good after that ACL tear he sustained last season. So you bring in him, uh, you bring in Javante Williams, you have Samaj P. Ryan at the, as the backup. Love to see that from Sean Payton. And with those two guys, you, you, you sign on the offensive line, Ben Powers, Mike McGlinchey, two very good run blockers. It is clear what Sean Payton is wanting to do to make his quarterback's life easier, run the piss out of the ball. I can guarantee that's what Sean Payton is going to be doing at times this year. Uh, they lose their, their fullback, Andrew Beck, to the Houston Texans in free agency. Uh, lose tackle Calvin Anderson to the New England Patriots in free agency. Um, they bring in Chris Manhurts from the Jacksonville Jaguars, big run blocking sort of guy there at tight end. Uh, bring in Frank Clark from the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, Tremont Smith, cornerback from Houston. Uh, Riley Dixon, they bring in the Los Angeles, Los Angeles Rams punter last year, is now the punter for the Denver Broncos. Uh, they do lose one of the great names in all of, all of uh, sports right now. I mean, when you lose Jacob Bob and Moyer, oh, it's, it's a hard, hard loss to take, man. Bob and Moyer uh, provides more than just a great name. He's a great player as well, great presence in the locker room. You're going to be missing Jacob Bob and Moyer from here until the end of time. Uh, what a fun name. What a Jacob Bob and Moyer. What a name. Uh, Mike Boone, uh, lose him to the Houston Texans as well. Uh, lose Graham Glasgow at guard. Uh, Kareem Jackson, you retain. Jake Martin, they lose to Houston. And Cameron Fleming, tackle, they retain as well. So there are your personnel moves. Let's get to the depth chart here. Obviously, Russell Wilson returning at quarterback with Jarrett Stidham being his backup. And big old Gucci Danucci as the third string as of right now. Like I said before, Javante Williams, Samat and J.P. Ryan are your top two running backs. Jerry Judy, Cortland Sutton, Tim Patrick, who, by the way, um, just sustained a, uh, an Achilles, too, after tearing his ACL last year. Brutal, brutal stretch of injuries for Tim Patrick. They won't have him uh, throughout this year. So that means K.J. Hamler and Marvin Mims will have to step up. Also, they bring in Marquez Callaway, by the way. Uh, there was a whole second page of that free agency that I just never got to. But they did bring in Mar Marquez Callaway in free agency. Um so a combination of those three will probably be, be stepping up in a, in a big way to fill in for Tim Patrick this year. Uh, with, you got Sean Payton calling the offense, so hopefully he'll be able to find some workarounds and get this thing moving uh, no matter who's in there. And Greg Dulcich-Delecce at your tight end right now with Alberto 
Alpert Okwebunam uh, as your backup tight end. A couple solid tight ends there and that I think Sean Payton will have a fun time uh, getting the ball to. Big question here, obviously, is Russell Wilson going to be that player uh, once again this year uh, that shits the game away, or is he going to be a player that wins you games? That's that's a big question mark for him. We won't know until we get on the field, will we? Uh, Michael Burton at fullback. Uh, Garrett Bowles that they have at left tackle, who is still there. Ben Powers they bring in free agency. Lloyd smoking that good Cush Cushenberry, uh, still there at, at center. Quinn Miners, Miners, I don't know. I'm gonna say Quinn Miners because it sounds better at right guard right now. Uh, same guys last year, draft pick from last year, I believe in the second, third round. Can't quite remember which one. Uh, also right tackle Mike McGlinchey, who they signed on that big deal in free agency. That rounds out your starting offense. And overall, I think they could be, if Russell Wilson turns out to be serviceable, I don't know if they're going to be one of the elite, elite offenses in the league. I think they could be right there, fringe top 10, though. I mean, never discount the Sean Payton effect. He can get an offense absolutely humming with whatever, whatever parts you give him. If Russell Wilson is even serviceable this year, you got two very good running backs, a solid group of receivers, even without Tim Patrick, as unfortunate as his loss is. Solid tight ends with Alberto and Greg Dulcich, and a, a solid offensive line with what you augmented it with. I think this could be a very good offense. I think it will be a solid offense at the very worst this year. On the defensive side of the ball, up front they got in this 3-4 defense with Vance Joseph. They got Zach Allen that they bring in free agency. DJ Jones at nose tackle. Frank Clark at defensive end there. Not really a 3-4 defensive end, so I'm not sure how that's going to work out for Frank Clark over there. Uh, should be an interesting transition to watch over from a, a 4, or I guess he more of a 3-4 outside linebacker, I'm fairly certain, or 4-3 uh, defensive end. Either way, I might be a little bit miscast there on the ESPN depth chart. Uh, as far as the line, weak side linebacker, uh, strong side linebacker, right now they got Baron Browning uh, starting at will. I can almost guarantee you it's going to be Frank Clark there in all likelihood. Maybe uh, either uh, Elijah Garcia, Matt Hensing, Hennings, Henningson. What a name. What a name there. Uh, one of those players probably going to be starting there in the front seven, uh, in the front three, with Frank Clark being one of that, that will outside linebacker. Also got Randy Gregory, uh, I believe, in free agency last year. He's coming back once again. Then you got Josie Jewell, Alex Singleton in the middle there. I believe they're returning uh, starters from last year, unless I'm, I'm mistaken with that. Uh, overall, kind of a shaky front seven. I mean, I don't feel great about this front seven at all. I mean, I like Zach Allen in there. I think he provides a lot of versatility for you. DJ Jones isn't isn't terrible. Um, I don't necessarily love Frank Clark at this point in his career. Randy Gregory always seems to be injured in, in some way or another, so I don't know. I don't necessarily love this front seven, but I do really love Patrick Sertain the second, and they do have him on the back end. They also got Kareem Jackson, Justin Simmons, very solid group of safeties that they've had back there for a good couple years now. Uh, big question mark for me, right cornerback Damari Mathis in the, uh, in the secondary there, uh, rounding it out, and I mean, as long as you got Pat Sertain uh, and Justin Simmons back there, I think you're going to be all right, but... Our team's going to pick on Damari Mathis this year. And if they do, is Justin Simmons going to neutralize that by just shadowing over top as the safety? We'll have to wait and see on that. Overall, as far as the defense is concerned, I don't, I don't know if they're going to be one of those top-end sort of uh, defenses this year just based on the, the personnel deficiencies. They're not going to be at the bottom half of the league, though. If you got an elite quarter, quarter, cornerback like that, easy for me to say, I don't see a dropping too, too far when it's all said and done. I think this is just going to be a solid defense uh, to, to be similar to what it was last year. I mean, probably a similar ranking uh, offensively that they'll be ranked defensively. Maybe not a top 10 unit, uh, but a unit that could be right there pushing right at the edge of the top 10 when it's all said and done. So, with that said, what's the ceiling on them? Um, right now... I would say we're just making this whole thing backwards. Ceiling, floor, who cares? Uh, ceiling on them, I would say probably 10, 11 wins, something like that. I think they're they're still got a, a better ceiling than the Raiders. They're a better team overall than the Raiders, and I think uh, Sean Payton's going to be doing a lot better job this year with what that uh, with that what that team needs coaching wise. Um, 
I don't see them being better than the Chargers. I don't really see them being better. Well, I, I shouldn't say that so certainly. They could be better than the Chargers. I definitely don't see them being better than the Kansas City Chiefs, though. They're probably third in the division right now, even at their ceiling. Uh, as a floor, I still think they had 9 and 8. I don't think their floor is that low. I think Sean Payton makes their floor higher. I mean, maybe if, if Russell Wilson plays bad again this year, uh, they could finish below 500. I just don't see it happening, though. I just I just feel like Sean Payton's going to find ways uh, to make, even if even if Russell Wilson is totally cooked, Drew Brees was totally cooked, too, and he made him look at least serviceable. I think that he, that's what he's going to do uh, with, uh, with Russell Wilson this year. Nine and eight is probably the floor, even if all things go wrong. In, in my opinion, anyways, it could totally be wrong, but that's that's why we do the, that's why we do the show. It's it's fun that way. Um, my actual prediction: ten and seven. Ten and seven feels like what this team is going to finish as this year. I don't see them necessarily uh, bumping through and and being one of the best teams in the entire uh, division in the entire league, for that matter. Um, I don't, I don't see them being bad either. Though. I think they'll be right there in the mix for a playoff spot. Maybe they won't get one. Maybe it'll be a big year in the AFC or something like that. But a ten and seven, you feel good about that in year one with Sean Payton, and you're only going to get better uh, going forward from there. So, ten and seven, I think they probably finish third in the division. My winner of this division, I mean, it's the Kansas City Chiefs. I'm never going, I'm never going against the Chiefs again. I'm not doing what I did last year. I'm not. I'm not calling for the Chargers to win the division because they got all these flashy free agencies. I learned my lesson. The Chiefs are the team to beat until proven otherwise. Uh, they're this. They're the modern dynasty. They have the greatest quarterback of all time. Come at me if you feel differently. You'll come over to my side eventually, as I like to say. And with that, that's the AFC West for you, folks. And that is this episode of Unqualified Analysis. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed, leave a like, subscribe, share with a friend for God's sake. It helps me grow this show a little bit more. If you want to follow me on my socials, is that Caleb Verzak. And just follow me on Twitter. You're wasting your time and your follows if you're following me elsewhere. But go ahead, follow my Twitter. I'm on there fairly frequently. I disappear for long stretches of time, but I'm on there fairly frequently enough, so catch me on there. A link will be in the description so you don't have to spell my fucked up Eastern Block name. I did the hard work for you there, so you can just click on it, hit follow, and then forget any of this ever happened. It was all just a bad dream in the end. Um, outside of that, um, if you want to contact the show, either shoot me a DM on Twitter or send something to the email, unqualifiedanalysis at gmail.com. Um, outside of that, I think that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for tuning in to Unqualified Analysis. As always, I've got no clue what I am talking about, but I'll tell you what, one thing I learned this week that was absolutely shocking, uh, Tilda Swinton, not just a descendant of William Wallace, a direct descendant of William Wallace, uh, the guy from Braveheart. You heard it here first, probably not first, but Interesting fact, though, wild actress Tilda Swinton that you may know from movies that I can't name right now, but num numerous movies I can't name right now, uh, direct descendant of William Wallace, a couple uh, dozen or more generations removed from that, famous Scottish king. So, cool, you learned a lot. Um, I'm going to go cry, I suppose, uh, or edit this thing. Either way, I'll talk to you all later. See ya.